The next case is a very interesting case of a 73 years old woman uh, who was diagnosed uh, several years ago with a carcinoma of the larynx. She was uh, she underwent surgery and uh, um, radiation therapy, and she developed uh, um, postacnemic uh, strictures of the cervical esophagus. That's why she underwent several um, esophageal dilations. In May 2018, um, she underwent another endoscopic dilation followed by a diathermic incision. I show you the procedure. Okay, this patient has been referred to us because she was not eating since a couple of years. She was just, she's uh, fed by pegs. So I did a little dilation and afterwards I used the uh, this pre-cut needle over the guy wire that was placed into the stomach, and after pre-cut incision, I dilated again, because uh, and at that point you see there was a nice opening of the balloon. Afterwards, we decided to go to the next slide. Yes. We decided to place uh, all Axio. Mm -hmm. And she fully recovered. And the reason, and the reason for place all axial because it was very high position. I think the patients could not tolerate the standard long esophageal stent, even though you use the shortest size. And it was a short suture, an astomotic suture. So I thought that all taxio was fitting, even though we all know it's a completely off-label uh, indication. We recognized that, we discussed it with the patient, we discussed it with the daughter, and um, she did uh, extremely well for about two months we, she got six kilos. She texted me saying, for the first time in uh, years, I had uh, some vegetables. Wow. So, but now she came back because uh, she was planning to come back today just for the course uh, to have uh, um, taxi removal. We will see what's happening. Ken. Hi. Hi, Ken. So it's ironic that the Axios was developed to address the off-label use of luminal stents for transluminal indications, and now we're using a transluminal stent off-label for a luminal indication. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I was hoping to see the axios in position, but if you look now at the endoscopic image, you'll see that the axios is One unfortunately second. no longer there. So the axios has migrated. But to be honest, I'm not so surprised because if I saw correctly, Ali, you did a strictural plasty yeah. and a dilation, yeah. and then you placed the axios. Yeah. And I think there, the risk of migration, because you've already pre-dilated so much, the risk of migration yeah, will was, be higher. Yeah, wasn't done in the same procedure. I waited, and the, she came back for ah, all the axio. Okay. okay. Yeah, so you, in the second procedure, you yeah. only placed the Because uh, I was scared about yes. recurrence of the stricture. Yes, because yes. We, we knew that you would have asked us this question. Uh, yeah. So that's okay. why we did that. All right. So this was, I think, an 8 by 8 Yeah, uh, I used was, the biliary one. Yes, the biliary one, yeah. Yes. So uh, we already looked with x-ray. We have x-ray here. Yeah, and, and I uh, want to comment the on the, yeah, can very shortly, I want to comment on the size. Yes. So there was a very, very limited space, very yes. limited space. This is why I use the biliary one. And uh, I have done another case, I use a little bit larger, I use the 10 millimeter. Yes. A again, with a very tough situation like this, with a post radiotherapy stricture, and the patients developed with the 10 millimeter such huge inflammatory reaction with the edema. And we had to use a lot of steroids to reduce the inflammatory reaction. So I'm very scared when uh, I use any kind of metal stent in the area of the cervical esophagus or distal pharynx that has been already treated with the radiotherapy because the inflammatory reaction is terrible. Yes, very good point, Ali. And um, this is a limitation of all stents, yeah. right? So because you're applying matter, radial we force. Used, we used to use the biliary stent as well, and 10 millimeter, and then we would switch out for a larger diameter. So for, you may remember the uh, Alimax stand, it yeah, the Alimax, 14, I remember. 16, 18. I will remember, 18. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we would gradually increase the diameters, but unfortunately the limitation is we always saw ulceration, hyperplastic tissue reaction, this is a limitation of this modality. Okay. What is the plan now? Yeah, I think Can the plan- Can we see Floro? So we see where the old Axio is, 
We're migrated. Yes. You have Floro? We have already tried. Yes, this is Floro. We have already tried to find the axios. Or we don't see Floro. Yeah. And hey, we can we have a Floro big? Yes. As you can see, Ali, mm -hmm. we are not able to see at the moment any axios. We moved the bed of the patient to check also in the stomach. Mm. And uh, we didn't see it. Okay. Although you have to bear in mind that it's 8.8, uh, .8, so it's very, very thin. So sometimes could be difficult to see an X ray, but. Okay. In this so what, case, what's next? Let's put in a 10 millimeter, okay? 10 okay. by 10. Okay. All right. It's also the only one we have available in the US. So I'm only used to placing 10 so by can 10. Can you show the technique now? Yes, okay. Yes. So we can do this all through a therapeutic gastroscope. So this has a 3.7 channel. So it's large enough to accommodate the 10 French sheath. So uh, Tom, if you can pass me. So um, you say hot axios, but if you happen to have the cold axios, you could use the cold because, of course, we don't need cautery for this. Sure. The cautery enhanced function is not needed. We're not penetrating through any wall. So we just want to deploy our axials, and we're going to deploy this no different than the way we would deploy a biliary stent in the bile duct. It's the same method now. So we're only going to use one part of the handle, and that's the part that releases the distal flange and the proximal flange in a two-step procedure. And because we're not going to lure lock this to the uh, endoscope, I'm going, to, I'm going to hand the handle to the assistant. So I'm going to manipulate the scope and the sheath myself, just like when we place the biliary stent. And the assistant will deploy the distal flange first, and then I'm going to pull back, retract, until I see the black mark. So this is actually where the black mark is very helpful. We uh, don't usually use the black mark because we, when we do this under EUS guidance, we deploy the proximal flange in the working channel, then we push it out of the working channel. Yeah. So but now we'll technique. actually use yeah. the black mark. Okay, so now I'm, I'm inserting, let me just get my position here. And normally this is a hydrophilic coating, so it's a little snug in the 3.7 channel, so uh, it's always good first to wet it down with some... Or we'll use uh, yeah, that, some silicone. But then you have to give the operator a little uh, gauze because, of course, it's also slippery in my hand. Yeah. And now, of course, Kenny, yes? in this particular situation, you have preloaded the uh, catheter with the guide wire in order to be... Uh, completely safe. That's correct. One moment here. Can I have you hold this, yep. please? Yes, thank you. One moment. We have some bubbles here, so... Okay, now you can see the tip, and we can advance our guide wire. It is the hot axis. You can see the diathermic wires, but you could use, of course, the cold one. So you can see the wire going, and we're going to look also on fluoro just to confirm. Just to be floral? very, very safe, we need to be sure that we are not in a false tract. Look where, look at the wire. Okay, so let's see. There it is. Okay, that looks very good. Okay, now we know we're, we're in. Okay, okay, stop floral, please. All right, now the next step is I'm just going to advance over the wire, and it's passing very, very smoothly. All right, and I've advanced a good distance inside, and now we're ready. Now, if you could show up with the camera, what the assistant is doing, what usually the endoscopist is doing. But in this case, this part here is, no, we're not using the black hub, right? That's to advance the sheath and retract. We don't need that. We're only going to use the gray hub to deploy first the distal flange. So Tom is now going to deploy the distal flange, and that can go quickly. So very quickly, we, he pulls we back. We can follow it radiologically if you want. If you want, yes but you don't need to. So now, yes, I'm just pulling how back. Does it I'm going to have the assistant keep me here at this distance. I'm pulling back till I see the black mark, and it will retract the distal flange and snug it up against the distal end of the... So I understand creature. that the black marker is very important when you do very important. under endoscopic vision, no? Yes. Correct. Now okay, there's the black have, mark, okay? okay? All right, so now we know that we're ready to deploy the proximal flange, and that should go slowly. All right, so as he starts to deploy, I'm going to pull back. Start to deploy, start to deploy, 
Can we have a flood One also? One moment here. There it is. See the, okay. the stand coming? Okay. Yeah. Endo. And there it is. That was endo, very endo. slow. This part endo. needs to be slow and controlled. Okay? And if you want at this point, if you want to look with floral, you can. But it's not needed. The floral is only needed, really, if you want to minimize floral. And I like to minimize floral. Can only you make for the a guide last floral placement. picture? Yeah. All right. So now you can see that it's not straddling the stricture. A new one. And I prefer not to dilate after I place this. I don't because I want to minimize the risk of migration. So I want yeah. it to seed in and let it expand on its own. So a couple of teaching points. So never delay before and then never delay afterwards. After. Yes, yes. So use uh, a relatively small size to avoid uh, too much radial tension and pressure on the mucosa. Yes. Uh, you don't need uh, any gastrographing afterwards. I don't and think you can needed. deploy, if you're able to pass through the stricture with the guy wire, you can deploy using a therapeutic gastroscope. So the first time we deployed with the uh, transnasal scope alongside the axio because we could not have access with the therapeutic scope. That would be an alternative. Yes, and, it, and this may have been necessary if the stricture were even a little higher then yeah. you don't have the room for a yeah. therapeutic no gastroscope, space. right? No but space. in this case, you can see it's okay. always better to work through the working channel because it stabilizes everything for you. And you can work I optimally coaxial. Thanks for and showing. By the way, so coaxial is the axial. Axial yeah. ostomy. Yeah. Can pay name. attention. Peter is a super expert of benign strictures management. So Peter, has a question to you. Uh, the, 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 I think one question is that these patients very often are complaining of pain when you play stents. How is the situation with this stent? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Well, patients often have a lot of, well, at least some pain when a stent is placed through a stricture that's high up in the esophagus. Is that, what is your experience in this? Or maybe Ali? Is pain, pain an issue? Pain. Oh, no. no, 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 we don't actually. We didn't see that big pain, yeah. really. So I have five patients now that have axios in for over a year. And you just leave it in. And yeah, patients... because this was the last, the last question. So what we do, we, we yeah. leave there for yes. long, we, what and we need to do. Until the patient develops dysphagia. And then you may be needed, because then you may have some hyperplastic tissue that is co compromising the stent lumen. That mm -hmm. is a risk. And, uh, and then I, I still, what I do is I go in and I balloon dilate. Mm. Right, and then I remove the uh, the old axios and I put a new one inside. Can the patient take uh, some food that is uh, afternoon, some liquids at least? Yes, yes, absolutely. And from tomorrow, regular diet if she can. Yeah, it's tolerated, but I tell the patients they yeah. whenever you have a stent, it should basically be pureed, soft, mechanical. And if you eat solid food, you must chew it very, very well then.